Nicole Krauss is the author of the celebrated books, Man Walks Into a Room, The History of Love, and Great House. She is the inaugural writer in residence at Columbia University's Mind, Brain, and Behavior Institute. She last visited us at the Free Library with Forrest Dark, a novel about transformation and self-realization that follows the disparate paths of an older lawyer and a young novelist searching for transcendence in an Israeli desert. She joins us tonight with her new collection, To Be a Man, Stories. A reviewer for Esquire writes, each story is masterfully crafted and deeply contemplative, barreling toward a shimmering, inevitable conclusion, proving once again that Krauss is one of our most formidable talents in fiction. She'll be joined in conversation this evening with Nomi Eve, author of Henna House and The Family Orchard, and director of the Creative Writing MFA program at Drexel University. And now, Nicole and Nomi, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here with you, Nicole. And I thought maybe we could start out with you reading two pages from one of your stories. I was hoping you could gift us with the first two pages of I'm Asleep But My Heart Is Awake. Sure. And thank you for being with me and everybody else who I can't see, um, but I assume and hope um, is there. So I'm asleep but my heart is awake is a, a line from Song of Solomon. Asleep in my father's apartment, I dream that someone is at the door. It's him, he is three or maybe four years old. He's crying, I don't know why, only that he is bitterly disappointed. I tried to distract him by showing him a picture book with beautiful illustrations in colors far brighter than those one gets in life. He glances at the book, but carries on anyway. In his eyes, I see that everything has already been decided. So instead I pick him up and carry him around on my hip. It isn't easy, but that's how it has to be because he's so upset, this tiny father child. The latch of the front door awakens me. I've been living here alone for more than a week. Now, lying still, I listen to the sound of footsteps entering and a bag being set heavily on the floor. The footsteps move away toward the small kitchen and I hear the creak of the cabinet open and close. The sound of water rushing from the tap. Whoever it is knows his way, so there's no one it can be. From the bedroom doorway, I see the stranger's broad stooped back. It takes up half the tiny kitchen. He gulps down a glass of water, fills it again, drains that one and a third. Then he rinses the glass and places it to dry upside down on the rack. He's sweated through his white shirt. He unbuttons the sleeves and rolls them to the elbows. He splashes his face with water, removes the check dishcloth from the peg, dries himself brusquely and step, st stops to press the towel into his eyes. From his back pocket, he produces a small comb and runs it through his hair smoothing it into place. When he turns, this face is not the face I expected, although there was no face I was expecting. This face is old and refined with a long nose and high flared nostrils. His eyes are hooded, but surprisingly light and nimble. He walks the few steps back into the living room, tosses his wallet on the table, and only then looking up, does he notice me watching him from the doorway? Oh, thank you. Really beautiful. What an amazing beginning to this collection. I really was beguiled by many things in this book. But one thing that I kept thinking about was strangers, which is something that, or someone who happens in this story and then in another story as well. I'm talking about Boaz and Sandor. In both The Husband and I'm Asleep But My Heart Is Awake, a stranger appears out of nowhere and acts almost as a kind of gravitational force that ends up pulling a fractured person or people together in a way that first they reject, but ultimately give into. Can you talk about strangers a little bit and how some of your characters seem to almost desperately need them? Yeah, of course. I love the question. Um, just a quick aside, which is that one of the great, wonderful gifts of these 
discussions and meeting readers, as you know, of course, but maybe the audience doesn't, is that you learn all kinds of things about what you've written and nobody mentioned. Wow. I, I love it. In the I book. Love the there, there are a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, there are a lot of echoes that tie stories together. And I think some of them are conscious and some of them, are, are, of course, are unconscious. They're the things that draw me and strangers are one. I think I've always really been interested in intimacy. I'm interested in, in life. I'm interested in it on the page. I'm interested in it between characters and also between the author and the reader. How does one create intimacy? Why do we long for intimacy? How is intimacy broken or betrayed? And also how we need the opposite. We need freedom from in intimacy. So all of those aspects are um, kind of on the table in this book. And I suppose The Stranger is the perfect encounter with the potential for intimacy because despite being strange, that person could be anyone. They could walk into your life and in the case of the husband, the other story, be presented as your family, your husband, <laughs> though he isn't and you have to absorb him into your life or you choose or you don't choose to or you do. In this case, this story is about a young woman, the narrator is a young woman whose father has recently died. Um, Alex just explained for our listeners, um, her father has died and she discovers that he has left her this, this apartment that he has in Tel Aviv. He is Israeli, but he brought her up in New York. Her mother died when she was young. And half a year, every year, her father would go back to teach at the university in Tel Aviv. And she never knew that he had this apartment. She always just assumed he stayed in, you know, whatever academic housing. And so it comes to surprise her. And so she goes there and the moment she walks into this place, she realizes it was almost more like home to her than her father's home in New York. Here were all the things he loved and his records and his books and the smell of his cooking. And she's only there a couple of days when suddenly this stranger lets himself in with a key. And much of the story is trying to work out who this person is, um, who doesn't go away, <laughs> even though she's there. Does it? <laughs> Yeah. It's so interesting to me because when you encounter him there as a reader, there are so many ways it could go. It could, you know, there could be, they could become intimate. Um, she, it could become violent. It, you know, he could just go away. And um, following along uh, towards the unexpected was just delightful. Um, well, I should also add, and I never know how much to say this because I don't know if it makes one sound naive as a writer, but it was an absolute surprise to me <laughs> as well. <laughs> and it always is. Every time I write a novel or a story, it's always as read. I never know where it's going. And in fact, this story actually took me years to finish. So I had the beginning of it for a long time and I had the same question that any reader will have, which is like, who is this guy? Um, and I actually remember in this one, I was so stumped with it that at a certain point, um, I sent it to Edgar Carrot and I said, how should the story end? Do you have any ideas? And he was like, I like the beginning, but no idea. It's not, not something I would normally do, but I was so stuck that I thought maybe somebody else would. Um, but then um, time passed. I think I wrote Forest Dark and then I came back to the story and I somehow knew exactly where it needed to go. This story with the stranger in the, um, in the apartment seems to me, it, it really, I don't think it would have made sense in the States, but it, as somebody who's gone back and forth to Israel my whole life too, it makes perfect sense to me in Israel. <laughs> Right. Well, this is one of the things I love about writing about different places. So there are expectations, there are levels of absurdity that are different in each country. And I'm, I know Tel Aviv, is, Israel isn't the only place. There are other countries I've been to where I have a similar feeling, like India, for example, many other places too, but where the level of rationality, practicality, the expected, is um, sort of less and surprise and um, just surreality, just things being surreal yeah. is the more regular part of life. And I love that as a writer. And so I find, I actually find it irresistible. And so there's a part of me that will always want to include aspects of that life in Tel Aviv or elsewhere, because this collection goes all kinds of places in the world. It does, which really leads me 
sort of into my next question. Um, history is heavy in these stories, family history, geopolitical history, political history, histories buried, and even embodied metaphorically. Um, in the story in the garden, the landscape architect's hopes are described as trampled by history into whose path he stumbled. I love that line. It like almost feels to me that your characters swim through history more than they walk through air. Mm -hmm. uh, history feels heavy right now at this moment in time in our country. And I just want to ask you, you know, what does it feel like for you to talk about your writing this week, now, here in Philadelphia? I know you're not in Philadelphia, but we are. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about that. What does it feel like now to be talking about your work? Hmm. So I want to answer that, and then I want to come back to history, because I think that's also something that I'd love to see. Oh, don't worry. That's the next part of my question. Oh, good. Okay, so I'll let you ask you then, because I want to come back to the presence of history in this book yeah. and how it presses down on people and how people try to become free of it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the moments now, wow. I mean, I think this book, for in my own career, will go down as the most absurd pub day in the world that was actually published on the election that day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I woke up that morning, I had already voted early, but I woke up that morning not thinking anything and opened the times and the review was, was there. So, but I thought, <laughs> okay, it happened. <laughs> um, so yeah, I th but I think it's, it's, there are two thoughts, like the immediate thought is who has time to read now, right? There's so many things that are, we're, demanding our attention, whether it's our kids who are not in school and at home in Zoom and all the, all the extra work we now have to do in life. And, and we're exhausted and we will need to watch the news because we need to know everything that's happening. <laughs> but I still have hope. And I, and I think this has been borne out by what I've seen and heard from others that kind of literature still is a place of not just refuge for us, but you know, it offers us this like parallel world. It always has. It offers us this parallel world and it's not the real world, but actually it's a place where meaning is constructed. And because of that, because it gives us coherence and consolation and structure and it moves us, it gives us reflection. It is as meaningful and sometimes becomes even more meaningful as this, you know, reality. And the wonder of it is that though it's parallel, though it's a separate world where these characters live and walk around and that we have to kind of find the slowness to enter into, right, as readers, we can, we as readers can smuggle back to this reality what we learn there. You know, we can't stay there, <laughs> alas, or maybe we wouldn't want to because some books are sad and full of suffering, but we come back here, but we take with us all kinds of reflections and the change, the transformation, maybe even the revelations that happen to us there. Um, and I think we need that always. Maybe we can even argue that we need that more than ever now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I tell my students that metaphor, which lives in literature, helps us express the inexpressible. Um, which happens over and over again on these pages. And we need to know how to express the inexpressible. Yeah, you know what I, I say about metaphor? I think that's great. So let, I want to build on that, which is to say that like metaphor is the, like the basic unit of literature, right? And why does it give us so much joy? Because like a great metaphor just thrills uh, all of us readers, anyone actually. And I always like to say that it has to do with the fact that it takes these two very, very unlike things and it draws them together, it creates a bridge between them. And why we find that joyful is that I think we want, as human beings, we want for things in the world to be connected. We want to find the connectivity underlying everything. And when we find it in a metaphor, suddenly it's promised to us again, right? Everything is not separate and, and chopped up and chaotic. 
but actually conjoined and part of a whole. Um, and so I just think it's like it touches this nerve in us that thrills. Yeah, I love that you said joy because you're right. A good metaphor does give all of us readers tremendous joy and it's nourishing. Um, but now, as I promised, let's swing back to history. Talk to me about history. <laughs> okay. Um, well, a lot of things to say there, but um, one of the things that, okay, so history is something obviously I thought about in all of my books and particularly the kind of struggle. I think this comes out of, you know, being raised in a Jewish family, but the struggle of what it means to have thousands of years of history pressing down on you, tradition, ritual, expectation, psychology, the beauty of that, right? To have, you know, and it's not, of course, only Jewish. Each of us who come from different places have that, maybe not as many thousands of years, but enough. <laughs> you don't need that much history for it to press down on you. Um, but we each have our history. It helps to give us a place and, and a belong, but also it can entrap us in a sense or confine us because, you know, we don't, feel that freedom, right, that we might have to become anything to grow. So there are stories in, that, in this book that deal with that, like um, Zushi on the Roof, which is right. about Broadman, this old professor yeah. of history, and his grandson is born, his first grandchild. And he feels that all of his life, Broadman feels that he's like sort of been torqued in the direction of duty and that he sacrificed so much of what he could have been because he needed to do, he needed to continue what his father, did, as Hebrew scholar did and his father before that. And, and he's frustrated and his life feels um, frustrated too. And then his child is born. And before the child is circumcised or brought into the arms of his people, Rodman almost wants to create an escape for him. You know, how, what, what would without it, precedent. Without precedent. What would it mean to grow without, you know, precedent, without, without all of that pressing down? So there, there, are thing, there are thoughts like that in the book. Um, but one of the things, again, to go back to this idea that we learn things about what we write by those who read our work and talk to us about our work or write about our work. There was a line, I don't, I don't remember in which review, but there was a line in which a reviewer said of this book, Nicole has been writing about, you know, the, the way the 20th century has informed us in many different ways. And it seems like at last she's writing about what it's like to live in the 21st century. And I think some of that is true too, that there's, that there's both the, you know, the shadow of history here and how it shapes us, but there's also a lot of stories in this book that are very much a reflection of what it is to live in the conditions of our time now. Yes, thinking of the post 9-11 story with the gas masks. Yeah, that, that's the oldest story in the collection. Most yeah. stories were written in the last eight years um, and many of them just in the last couple of years. But that story um, was the first short story I wrote and I wrote it just after I finished my first novel, which was just after 9-11, literally months after 9-11. I wrote that story and um, it's called Future Emergencies. And of course it's about this, this um, announcement that's made in New York City over the radio that everybody needs to go get gas masks and, and nobody understands why. And everybody in the city then begins to walk around with them. And, and it's really a story about a couple, about a relationship between a younger woman and her older boyfriend and whether she's going to stay or go. Mm -hmm. But it becomes also about this anxiety that's sifting through the very air of the city, although nobody knows what it might be that's, that might cause them to become ill. Or, um, and I won't give away the end, but it was really strange to go back and find that story and put it in the book. And then after I closed the book and gave it to the publisher a couple of months later, all of New York City was walking around, not in gas masks, but another kind of mask. So crazy. <laughs> so crazy. And, you know, in terms of history, just to tie it back in, there's so much, so many windows, even in that story, to history. The, the boyfriend is a history professor. She is a, um, she gives tours at an art museum and is looking at photographs from history, paintings from history. It's even walking through sort of modernity, there's, there's no way for them to live without precedent. Um, yeah. yeah, I think, and I think there are other ways, right? So the past, there's both the press, precedent of what's come before and the way that it shapes us, 
there's the way the past keeps delivering to us, like in the lost husband, for example, or the way that our past deeds keep informing our sense of ourselves, like in the garden where this mm -hmm. Latin American landscape designer has been forced to make very big moral compromises in order to do what he does and he is haunted by them. And so there's the past is always creeping in, but at the same time, I think um, there's a sense of future and that future has to do with many of these characters are standing at the threshold of a door like that one in Future Emergencies deciding, do I stay or do I go? Like what is, do I stay behind in this relationship or this life or this set of circumstances? Um, or do I move forward and break those bonds so that I might have fresh experience and change and become something else? Really wonderful. That leads me to my next question here, which is about, I guess I'll say, what is hidden? Um, in many stories in this collection, characters are grappling with a sense that things that essential things have been hidden from them. In the first story, the narrator says of Soroya, I was afraid of what I might discover beneath my understanding, which is really interesting because there's this sort of concept of I understand, but I don't understand. There's a bottomless floor almost of what could be hidden. Um, and in other stories too, um, in speaking of the dissolution of her parents' marriage and end of days, Noah, the narrator observes that she would have liked to believe that only recent events had been hidden from her and her siblings, rather than a fundamental truth that went back many years. There are other examples in the book of characters who grapple with secrets and are unnerved by them. Can you talk about the place of hidden truths in your work? <laughs> And it's another great question that nobody's ever asked me. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, very, very specifically, the hidden rooms of parents' lives comes up a fair bit in this book. So you mentioned Noah and her parents decide she's already nearly finished with high school and her parents decide to have this very amicable divorce. Um, they've always gotten along, so it's hard to sort of understand. And so it opens up the sense of their hidden desires and what, what may have been going on there. But even in the story we talked about, I'm asleep but my heart is awake, there's this hidden, literally hidden rooms of a father's life. And I don't know if you remember, but in, um, in the husband, Tamar is talking about her mother, who this husband has been delivered to her door. And Tamar is talking about being a mother. And she says, I don't know, there was always some way in which my own mother had this ability when I was younger to pay complete attention to me, my brother, my father, but somehow she seemed, did she seem to keep something away for herself that was only hers? And what was it? And is this husband some part of that? So I think, you know, we all experience that as children who grow up and we, we recognize not all at once, sometimes bit by bit, that our parents have these pasts and these parts of themselves that we haven't been privy to that are independent of us and they're their own. And then we become parents, many of us, and we discover that we have aspects of ourselves and parts of ourselves that remain hidden until our children are old enough to understand them. So that's one example. And I don't think it, it, there's not a, it's not a judgment in it, right? We need, we can't live exposing ourselves always to everyone. The parent-child relationship is a perfect example of that. But even between lovers or between friends or what the past aspects of the past are hidden to us, obviously, what will happen to us is in this. So we're constantly dealing with unknowns, with uncertainties about each other, about our lives, and we still have to navigate those. We still have to make decisions about how to live and how to relate, even with those voids, let's say. Thank you. Um, another question for you is about doubles. Um, the Arsh in um, the Arshadi story, um, the actor and Arshadi the man double each other. Uh, the narrator in I'm Asleep But My Heart is Awake, who looks at a picture of his father and sees himself. And then Sandor in The Husband, who's a double for a dead husband. Um, doubling in literature is a way of putting a mirror to the soul, amplifying sort of the, the grace and um, terror of what it means to be human. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about doubling in your work? 
And whether it's something that you set up to do or something that just happens, something that surprises you, I, I kept sort of finding more examples all throughout. I won't bore you with all the quotes uh, from my notes, but um, could you just talk a little bit about- What was the first example? I wanna remember because it's another great question. What was the first example of a double? The first example is with Ershadi. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and with Ershadi, there's actually multiple doubling because okay. the friend who has an experience just like the narrator, uh, you said there's like Ershadi alive, Ershadi dead. Right. So I so there's also doubling in in Forest Dark as well. Um, I guess I do it a lot, but I think so. Now let me think about this while I'm speaking. I think it has something to do with well a number of things. One is that when we double or in your shy case triple, we have this ability we don't have it in life, but to see something from multiple vantages, right? And one vantage often isn't enough, just like when you have, um, when you're filming, a, a, making a film, you need more than one camera, right? It adds dimension. But in literature, if we look at a person from one angle and then somewhat double him or, you know, not literally, but <laughs> in a kind of oblique way, then we have another chance to look at that thing slightly removed, but it, it echoes back. And I think it's just a very, subtle way that the writer that me, me my case me but other writers do it too create again a sense of structure for meaning right so that the, the reader is able to follow those clues this leads to this and so mm -hmm. then just in the, in the less technical um way a more general way i always think of my urge to write as partly coming from the fact that i it's not enough to have one life. Like it doesn't, it feels too mean, too meager to have one life. And so I'm, I have all this language, this excess of language that isn't enough for one life. And I know I have all this desire for experience that can't be fulfilled by one life. And so on the page, I have these, these opportunities to inhabit other beings and many other places, right? And, and I, that came from, for me, early on before I was a writer, that's why I became a reader, like that hunger and curiosity and not enoughness with this world led to being a reader. So I think again, in the writing, sometimes the doubling is exactly that. So in Forest Stark, Nicole talks about being in two, there's a character called Nicole, talks about being in two places at the same time. Like she has this literal sensation, this uncanny sensation, she walks into her house and she feels that she's already there somewhere else, maybe like upstairs and mm -hmm. last, it's been last for a little while and then it's gone, but it begins to shape the book in some ways and it comes back again at the end of the novel. So I think, you know, there's that sense of like, we, we live many lives in one life or we don't have enough lives in the one life. All of those things go into that doubling. Well, it's um, the, the doubling, almost creates more space in the stories um, for sort of multiple consciousnesses. And um, I, I, want to, I want to add one thing to your, to your example about seeing our shoddy. Now this is outside of the story, but it's a really wonderful story. So I want to share it with you um, and the audience, which is, so just very briefly for the, the listeners who haven't read the story, Singer Shadi is about um, a young woman. She's a dancer in Tel Aviv and she has a lot of time in the afternoon. Her ankle is kind of busted from dancing and she watches all these films and she falls in love with this film called Taste of Cherry, which is um, a real film directed by Abbas Kiristami, an Iranian, direct, Iranian director. And she becomes obsessed with the actor in this film whose name is Hamayun Ershadi. So that's where the title of the story comes from, Seeing Ershadi. Um, and Urshadi, this is a real story. Um, the, the director, Kiristami, who's I think the finest director to have come out of Iran, made some of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen. Um, he one day was walking around Tehran and he saw Urshadi in a car. He was an architect, he was sitting in traffic in Tehran, he knocked on the window and he said, you know, could you be my film? And so you see this man throughout this film and this, the camera almost never leaves his face or his body. He wants to kill himself and he has dug a grave for himself outside of Tehran in these bone dry hills. And he simply wants someone to cover him with dirt in the morning after he's taken the sleeping bills. 
but that amounts to um, you know blasphemy in the Quran, like you you know it's for obviously forbidden um, suicide is forbidden. So he's looking for someone to do this, and that's the entire film. So she becomes obsessed with the idea that Arshadi's face, as he plays the character in this film, is so real; it conveys so much grief that he couldn't be acting, that he, has to, he had to really have been feeling that. Okay, so that there's the doubling you're talking about. And then the story goes on and it turns out her good friend also has a similar experience with this film. And so then, and, and the story becomes about many things. Suffice to say, um, the story was published in the New Yorker a couple of years ago. And then uh, the day or the day after it came out, I received an email um, through my editor there that came from the director's son, Kirastami's son. Kirastami has since died. And he spoke to me about the story and his, his warm feelings about it and said everyone from Tehran and all over the world was writing to him about it. And I asked him, do you know if the actor, Shadi, has read <laughs> the story? And he said, I'll find out. And so um, he wrote to his sister in Tehran and um, next day an email came back to me and he said, you won't believe this, but he was really down. He was having a hard time and he read your story and now everybody all over the world is texting him and calling him <laughs> and he feels much better. And then at the bottom of the email, he sent me a screenshot of Ershadi's Facebook page and he had posted the story like without a comment. And it was so moving. I mean, on every level, it was so moving because it's like, okay, talk about doubling and tripling and quadrupling, but also the way in which a movie affected me all my life. I've think, been thinking about that movie since I saw it more than 20 years ago. And then 25 years ago, I think, I almost, whenever it came out. And then a story gets written about it and there's a real actor and, a real, and then things happen that, and then that ends up back, going back to the actor. And the, it's, one, it's sort of like, you know, that sometimes it happens. We're talking about the past <laughs> world of art and life. Some, occasionally they cross. That's incredible. Yeah. And could be in the story. <laughs> right, could be in the story. It wouldn't and take much, part. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a question here in the Q&A and, um, People who um, have joined us so graciously, uh, please do feel free to put questions in the Q&A. Um, there's a question here. Um, I'm really curious, what are your responsibilities as the writer in residence at Columbia University's Mind, Brain and Behavior Institute? Yeah, great question. So I have the luck of being the first writer in residence there. There are, um, they started artist residencies last year and um, they had a jazz musician and a visual artist, um, the sculptor Sarah Z, S-Z-E. And this year, Julie Maritru, the painter, is the artist in residence. And um, there's another um, jazz musician, and then there's me. <laughs> and basically, um, well, it's rather, it's changed since the pandemic started, but it began with and has continued over Zoom with having the privilege of speaking to all of the neuroscientists there. So there's, um, I think about 60 labs there and then many people working in those labs. So the scientists, postdocs, trainees, um, and they're each working on different things. So you have people from all aspects of neuroscience being brought together. Um, and so I get to speak to each of them and learn about their work. And they speak to me if they're curious about what I do. And I give some talks and lectures and I've done some classes with them. Um, those who are interested in, in literature, but it's really about this crossbreeding of science and art um, and without an expectation of necessarily what, what will come out of it. But um, I suppose I was invited in part because I've written a lot about memory um, all my life as a novelist. And of course, memory is a huge subject of study there um, from many different angles, whether um, it's work on the hippocampus or decision making and how it relates to memory, many, many things. So, yeah. That is fascinating. What, um, it sounds like a really nice gig. <laughs> it's a really nice gig. <laughs> uh, there's another question here. Um, I'm going to read it. Um, it seems to me that your work often deals with the multiplicity of the self new aspects of both strangers and loved ones are revealed in different contexts. And it poses the question, how much is it possible to know of another 
or even of the self? And how do you navigate the tension of the variable and unknowable self as a writer? Mm. Well, I suppose I, the very short answer to the very end of the question is that the luck or hardship of being a writer is that your only work is mining the self, <laughs> which is not to say that you aren't endlessly imagining and endlessly casting your imagination toward others and what it's like to be them and other worlds and other places, but you can all, I can only get there by what I have, my own experiences and memories and my own facility at trying to understand those things, paying attention to those things. So it's an at first have to go in in order to go out. Um, I think the question of unknowability is interesting because it relates to something I feel strongly about as a writer, which is that to cling too closely to certainty is a kind of betrayal of the truth, right? That there, that maybe this is my um, Jewish soul speaking. We know we're taught to value doubt above all else, argument, doubt, um, to sustain uncertainty. Think about like, you know, rabbinical arguments where the point is to keep the argument aloft, never to resolve it. There's something in me, both maybe as um, a Jewish soul, but also as somebody who grew up in literature, like literature teaches the necessity of ambiguity, right? The novel is only about ambiguity, really, um, at the end of the day, about human beings and ambiguity, what it is to be human and, and have to deal with that and uncertainty. And, and so I feel there's some honesty in that um, and, and I don't wanna try to escape it. So, but that doesn't mean that I can escape the question of trying to know better, trying to know others better, um, whether it's my characters and relationships to relationship to themselves and others, or whether it's me and my relationship to myself and my work, um, while also knowing like that there will always be <laughs> massive fields of the, not just the unknown, but the un unknowable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that sort of leads into my next question, which is um, in, in the garden um, story, whose name is escaping me. Oh, it's called In the Garden. In the Garden, right? There's a line that describes what the secretary to the landscape artist um, sees as the landscape artist's dreams for his garden. Um, and that line just really jumped out at me and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. The line is, he calls it a wildness barely contained. Um, a wildness barely contained. I just love it. It's gorgeous and so evocative. And it seems to me to also describe your stories, your characters, the sort of discursive swirl of their thoughts. And I'm just wondering about that for you. I'm wondering, is a wildness barely contained what you write towards? Um, I think that's... I, I... I'll, I'll let you say it. <laughs> I don't know that I would ever say it, but it sounds absolutely perfect to me. <laughs> um, I, I, what I do sometimes say is that um, in the same way that when we raise our children, we want them, it's our job to allow them to be free next to the, us, right? To teach them how to be free next to us, but at the same time, we have to offer them subtle reflection that helps them shape themselves or become more of who they want to be, right? So there's this task that's a little bit of a paradox. And I feel it's the same with my characters and my writing that I have to allow a lot of room and air and freedom. I, as I said before, I don't know what's going to happen. And so things are allowed to happen in my work all the time before I know how they're going to resolve or what they mean. But if I don't hold the reins to some degree, if I'm not, uh, you know, if I don't find a way to control the wildness to some degree, it will be incoherent. It won't be interesting to the reader nor to me. And we will never arrive at an end where we have some sense, not of resolution. A resolution doesn't interest me very much, but we have a sense of ideally, I guess, a revelation or just discovery, or at least a coherence that, that gives us the consolation or satisfaction of meaning. Something has come to mean, right? And 
So how do you, how to balance those two things? And I don't think this is just in writing. I think this is across the board in art. I think of, you know, a friend of mine who's an extraordinary choreographer and how do you choreograph wildness of the body, you know, abandon and joy and pain, but why, let the full expression of that happen in the body, but still have it be ordered, contained into, into art. Or even, you know, that line that you mentioned came from um, visiting um, Brazil and seeing the work of Roberto Burl Marx, who isn't at all the landscape architect in, the, in, in this book. But, you know, in, he brought back all the native species of Brazil instead of having these like English gardens that were in the fashion back then. And, and there was this return to the wildness of what grows in Brazil, but how do you make a modern garden out of that wildness, right? So um, I think that that's something we're always considering. And maybe those of us who are as artists drawn particularly to a kind of recklessness in art, um, there are artists that are more reckless than others in their work, not necessarily in their life, although sometimes in their life as well. Um, I think we're drawn to that tension, the recklessness and the sense of order, the tension mm -hmm. between the two. What's harder for you, the recklessness or the order? Oh, wow. Well, um, uh, it, 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 it changes. It's never one or the other, truly. I, um, I really respond well to things being orderly, but I really object to things being too orderly. Like, as a reader, I really don't like when I feel led along like by a leash by a writer where things are too decided or linear and it doesn't leave me enough air as you were saying before to to discover things on my own. So I don't mind hints and I don't mind, and I want the writer to have the absolute authority that I never question that she doesn't know what she's doing, but I want to be allowed to find my own way. And so too much order and control really really I rebel against. Um, and, you know, too much recklessness is scary, right, for all of us to some degree. Um, so it's just, just the right amount. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you another question, and soon we're going to wrap up. But I wanted to ask you about revisiting old stories, because uh, this collection really does span years, right? You wrote some many years ago and some just a few years ago. What was it like for you to revisit your older stories and sort of pick them out for this collection and say, yes, this worked then, it works now, it belongs with these other stories. Um, did you re like rediscover anything about yourself as a writer or otherwise in reading them again? Did you, did you revise old stories or were they done then? Um, so, yeah, so the, um... As I said, I think that aside from Future Emergencies, which is really old, 2002 it was published, but written still in, in uh, 2001. I think the very, oh, I'm trying to think that the, the oldest one is like 2012. So they're not that old. And, and there were maybe, so when I decided to write a collection, I had four stories. So I had that, that really old one and I had three others that were written maybe like 2010 through 13, maybe one each year. So that, I guess that was a long time ago now, but not that long ago, by the way. Um, and so I already kind of, you know, I, I think that, okay, the, the concerns have changed. So for example, Zushi on the Roof, the one about Broadman, mm -hmm. that was written right after Great House. And it came, actually that story came because of um, one of this really interesting reviews I read of the book by an, um, a reviewer in Haaretz who was an Israeli psychoanalyst. And he was basically, it was a weird review because he was analyzing me and the ways in which I felt that Jewish history was a burden, right? And so the story came out a kind of response to that. And so I guess there are ways in which, you know, those early ones mark moments in my life or career. But then most of this collection was written as a collection. So it was written after Forest Dark. Um, I was thinking of these stories in conversation with each other. Um, I always knew it was gonna be called, the collection was called, gonna be called To Be A Man, but it surprised me how many of the stories then became about women. Um, oh. <laughs> women, of course, yeah. often dealing with men, um, involved in men, with men, their fathers, their lovers, their husbands, et cetera. Um, 
but really not only relating to men, but you know, inventing themselves, younger women who are kind of inventing themselves, maybe sometimes like in Switzerland in, in the theater of uh, a sexual relationship with a man. But I always knew I was gonna call it to a man. And so that last story in the book was the story I was driving toward, but it was the last story that I wrote. Um, and that story really became about what it is to be a woman looking at the men in her life, her father, a lover of hers, who's called the German boxer, a friend of hers who's an Israeli soldier, and then finally her two young boys who are growing up and will become men. Wow. Okay, one last question from a, a, a viewer is, um, what are you reading now? Oh, wow. Um, let's see. I, what's the, um, I'm reading, um, new book by Yehoshua, the Israeli writer. He just came out with a book called um, The Tunnel. Oh, I'm reading, oh, I know what I, I'm really enjoying. Um, one of my favorite living writers um, is the German writer Jenny Erpenbeck. I don't know if anyone in the audience has read her, but her most recent book was um, Go Went Gone, which I can't recommend highly enough. But I've been reading her since her first book, I don't know, maybe about 15 years ago. Um, and since I've become friends with her and see her in Berlin, but I really think she is like as good as it gets. Like she's going to win a Nobel Prize good. <laughs> and I'm reading now, I picked up um, just the other day from the bookstore, um, a, the newest translated book of hers, which is a collection of essays, really. Uh, it's called, This Is Not a Novel, um, A Memoir in Fragments. Yeah. And um, and it's it's quite absolutely beautiful and I was sitting reading it like in the sunlight yesterday in this incredible weather in my chair by the window and I thought like this this is why I do it <laughs> because it can be this good yeah so I recommend her that's great um I'll ask one more question because we have a little more time um Hebrew in your work fascinates me for many reasons one because Every time I come upon a Hebrew word, that word resonates not only with meaning, but with choice. Why, why is this word in Hebrew? Why, you know, and is this word going to be translated? Is this word not going to be translated? And some words are and some aren't. Um, and to me, this speaks to audience and who, who your audience is, who's reading it. So for example, maybe uh, what was the word? Get is translated, but I, I don't think to fill in R. Or I, I don't know. It, it's, you know, so this led, led me to think about your work in Hebrew and translation in Hebrew. Um, and I'm assuming this, this is translated into Hebrew. And I wonder if the same choices get made. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I don't know. So you mean in terms of explaining what something yes. is? To fill in is the, sorry, get is the Jewish divorce agreement. Yes. Or, um, so maybe I can first answer the question backwards. I do know, like, since I've been publishing books, there's, this has sometimes been an issue when the books are translated into really, at least for me, far-flung languages. So I remember, like, with the Greek edition of the history of love, they wanted to have like a Yiddish glossary or something. And I actually kind of objected to that because I felt like it sort of took over. You know, there are lots of things we encounter in books where even in English, we read in our own language, there are words we don't know. We look them up, we figure them out. And, and it, you know, the world is not so large and distant that you couldn't find what a schmuck was or what a tefillin right. was. You needed to look it up on Google or whatever. You really needed to know what a schmuck was. So you could figure it <laughs> out. Yeah. So, um, but, so I think um, it, it's interesting. I had to make this choice very, very recently. I just wrote a story during the pandemic and um, it's coming out in Harper's Magazine, um, the December issue, which I guess will be out very soon now. And um, it's about, um, it takes place during quarantine and it's about um, the Shomrim, the, the people in, in, were in a Jewish death, um, the body can't be left alone. You know, there's no mean, of course, but for those listening, the body can't be left alone. And so from the time of the death until the burial, which is usually 24 hours, 
there's always somebody watching the body and and it's often just a stranger somebody from the community anybody can do it anyone can volunteer to do it you need any special skill or um and so it's often you know every two hours somebody changes and it's through the night or wouldn't it you know um and so the story becomes about this old retired painter who is asked to do this during COVID because nobody else really can. He's already had the illness and he's recovered. And um, But anyway, there was a lot of question for me about how much to explain about that. And in the end, I, I, I um, had a long conversation with some you know, various friends about where that practice comes from and the ancient reasons for it and the belief that the soul lingers for a time and um you know really fascinating things about ancient burial in israel and caves thousands of years ago that led to that and um so some things didn't go into the story but then you know even friends of mine brought up jewish in jewish households might might not know what it is to be a shomer right what the shomerim are what a shomer is and so um, and so I explained it in the context of the story, right? But you always, it's in voice, right? It's a, it's a first person, so you have to find the, or no, it's third person, close third person, but you have to find a way to do it, right? Um, that doesn't intrude on the reader's sense of, I am with a person, not with a tour guide, <laughs> right? And the author isn't butting in to tell me stuff. It's a really delicate balance. I face it in my own work and I, um, I just am so interested in um, how it works in your stories. Uh, and each time you make there, a choice is made to define or not to define, that choice makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it's it's just it's very interesting. It just led to all sorts of thoughts in my mind. <laughs> there's, one, there's one bit, I think, in uh, in Forest Dark where there's uh, a scene where somebody's cursing in Hebrew and I just put the curses in Hebrew so this I think in those cases it would just go over and in Hebrew letters that's in Hebrew letters so it wouldn't mean anything to some people who but you don't need to know like you've been the context of the story you know that this is a driver who's a jerk and he's cursing and somebody's cursing back at him and as as Israeli drivers are want to do to each other <laughs> so um yeah. great well this has been such a delight um I love chatting with you. I love your background. I must say it's beautiful. Thank you very much. I think that's called a Susani. It's a kind of tapestry. Yeah, thank you. Really beautiful. Um, I hope you are safe and well. Um, good luck with the rest of this tour. Thank you to everybody from the Philadelphia Free Library for joining us tonight. And um, take care, everybody. Thank you for having me and thank you for this conversation. It really was a huge pleasure for me too.